not in any way a Kubernetes ex expert. So um, forgive me if I can't answer all of her questions, but I will try my best. Um, and yeah, let me try to share my screen. Actually, Let's see, is that now? Cool. Um, can you guys see this? Yes. All right. Yeah. So today I'll be presenting a little bit about Kubelinter. It is essentially an open source tool for you to check your YAML and help charts. And I guess a short disclaimer, like before I start, uh, the contents are all from Stack Rocks and I'm just here presenting. So a uh, little bit about what we will be covering today. A uh, short introduction on what is Kubelinter and also why Kubelinter. And installation, uh, workflow, configuration, I guess these three items, I will try to uh, wrap them in a demo. And also I will touch briefly on integration, how this can be integrated with their existing uh, CI CD pipelines, for example. And um, last but not least, I will be covering a little bit about what's next for the project, uh, a roadmap essentially. So I guess before I start, a little bit about myself. Uh, I guess hello everyone again, my name is Koki. And actually I, I recently just left Stack Rocks. But during the time I was there, I worked, uh, I, work, I worked on this project with uh, one of the colleague, Vishra. I'm not sure if he's in the call today. I, uh, but yeah, uh, I worked uh, I worked on this project and uh, for about a couple months. So yeah, I'll be presenting this Kubelinter product for you today. So what is Kubelinter? Uh, I guess in short. It is a command line tool that you can run to essentially lint against your Kubernetes manifests or Helm charts uh, to essentially report on any security pit force improvements uh, that you can make uh, on your Kubernetes demo files. So, I mean, as it says here, it is a command line interface for linting Kubernetes objects. And, and this tool actually comes with a couple of default security or like a check policy spake thing for enabling best security practices. And actually also allows you to configure or, or write a configuration file for it to customize your own Kubelinter, essentially for, let's say, if you want to rule out or rule in particular checks, or even you know, uh, if you want to write your own check. Uh, there's so essentially a couple of check templates that we uh, built into the tool. And you can extend those check templates to write your own custom checks providing, by providing your own uh, parameters. And it's really simple to use. Uh, it's simple to install, simple to use. And I guess I will also show you guys a bit about that you know, in the demo. So why Kubelinter? I guess this uh, overlaps a little bit about what, is, what I just talked about. But again, it's very simple. And it's relatively low knowledge gap. What that means is that you know, it just works like any other linting tool. You just call dot slash equivalent or just equivalent lint on, let's say, a directory or a file, and it just uh, reports you any of like any error it found or security, not errors, I guess, like pitfalls it found, um, finds. And it is Kubernetes focused. Um, it's really easy to identify misconfigurations. Um, I guess also in the demo, you will see that each uh, line consists of like an error that it finds and also um, a remediation step that you can take. Although sometimes those remediation steps will, also includes a nice link for you to essentially better, let's say, educate yourself about like what this error is particularly uh, talking about. Um, yeah, and also you can define, easily define configurations, customize your own Kubelinter tool. And also we have a nice documentation page from our GitHub page for you to essentially familiarize yourself with uh, security about uh, the security about Kubernetes, security of Kubernetes, and um, also it is very easy, easy to integrate into existing pipelines and build operational policy. Again, that that is like about uh, we can extend existing checks uh, or existing check templates for you to build your own custom checks. Um, yeah. So I guess uh, I'll be starting a, a short demo here. But before, I just want to make sure, you know, if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer. If otherwise, I'll just be going to demo.
I had, I had a quick one. Um, a lot of the linters, not in the, in that they were designed for it, but there mm -hmm. are uh, exporters or scrapers or whatever that that are then consumed into things like sonar cube or those type of things. Mm -hmm. Is that something which, and and then then they can re, you know give some reports and plus uh, some history you know as things progress or uh, digress right. Mm -hmm. uh, is that something that uh, that you support in the sense of like sonar cube or those type of things? Uh, as of now, no, uh, not entirely. So I guess until recently, oh, we actually just added support for JSON outputs. And um, let's say if downstream, you know, any of the job consumes a JSON output, yeah, you can do that. But I guess in terms of like history and stuff, no. As of, as of right now, we don't support any of those. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, I guess you know um, just a little bit about the project. Actually, the project itself wasn't you know developed like doesn't have a really long history yet. It has about like maybe a little less than a year. But mainly, you know, was the project developed by uh, another uh, my, my colleague Vishwa and a little bit about a little bit from me. Um, so we had limited resources. So. Yeah, there's a lot of features that hasn't yet been completed or just hasn't yet been shipped. But um, yeah, I, but still, I will show you guys a quick demo about like what the project currently can do. Let's see. Um, cool. So you guys able to see the terminal? Maybe a little bit. Um, Larger? Yeah. Yes, please. OK, let's see. Maybe. How about now? How about now? Is that good for everybody? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So yeah, uh, this is just a, a, I guess, contrived example that I set up for this purpose of this demo. Uh, we have compliant.yaml, kubelinter, non-compliant.yaml. And this kubelinter binary will be the tool that we use today. Um, you can essentially download directly the binary from our releases page, or you know, there's go get command for you to download this Kubelinter binary. Uh, the, and also, for uh, just for information, this Kubelinter is entirely implemented using Go. So yeah, and if you run this binary, we can see that there are five commands supported: checks, help, cleans, templates, version, and the most important one, of course, will be lint, right? Um, and actually, let's let's do this. Right, lint non-compliant. You can see that this already reports a bunch of errors, and we can take a quick look at what this non-compliant.yaml does. Um, this is essentially a really short, you know, and really like uh, simple definition of a Kubernetes deployment. And you know, just you know, as you open it, you can directly see this this is like you're importing a secret key uh in the plain text as environment variable to your deployment this is definitely not like secure and maybe some other things that we can obviously spot you know uh like service account non-existent it is referring to a service account that doesn't exist at all or um let's say for example it doesn't set any cpu limits or memory limits on this deployment things like that um I guess if we exit this file, we can see that, yeah, for example, the first error that it raises, right? Environment variable, AWS secret key in container engine X found. Um, and with this is, that's like the error message that he raises. And this like check is just a check name. So again, this tool comes with a couple of baked in checks. And um, this is just triggering one of the checks that we have uh, implemented. And also, it comes with like a remediation. Uh, don't use raw secrets in an environment variable. Instead, either mount a secret as a file or use a secret key ref. Yeah, and also have, gives you a nice link for you to educate yourself. I mean, yeah, other errors are more or less uh, following the same suit, um, just on different things. For example, like second one, just, it just doesn't have a read only file system. And third, third one was the service count thing that we just talked about. Yeah, so. It's really easy to use, and and in this case, I'm just showing to you know showing guys the example of linting in a single file, like non-compliant. But this this file can be another directory, 
and that then in that case the coolant just will just recursively uh, cross for uh, uh, Kubernetes YAML files and just try to report errors on those. Um, let's see. And after seeing that, let's try to do the lint on the compliant one. This essentially fixes all the errors I just talked about, except for one, uh, as we see here. The container nginx does not have any read or remove file system. I intentionally left this one out. So if you take a quick look at this compliant.yaml, and please ignore these two lines for now. Um, this is, uh, again, a simple definition of uh, Kubernetes deployment with also like a service account definition. And if you look at line 28, I intentionally set this to false, like we only rule file system to false. I mean, you know, like for, it could be the case that this deployment just really needs a local write access um, for whatever reason, right? And in this case, maybe you just want to ignore this specific no read only, read only root file system check. And I wanted to show you guys the way to do it. And Kubernetes has a way to do it. You can essentially include this annotation right here. Ignore check dot io slash no, no read only root file system. This is just a reserved tag that we have in this tool and followed by a check name. And you can get the check name. I will show you guys later. You can get the check name from dot slash Kubernetes checks list. And it will just show you all the default checks that that's there. And this is followed by a reason, a short descriptive uh, message, like maybe for you or maybe for a teammate just to read like why you have uh, excluded this check. Um, and if you do that, and compliant, yeah, no linear errors found. So, sorry, was there a question? Oh uh, yeah, I had a quick question. Um, okay. So I'm getting a little deja vu, and I realized it. This reminds me a lot of OPA and the policies that they've written. Do you have? Do you pull mm. those in? Are all the checks statically defined? Because you know, like, there's so yeah. much overlap, right? Like yeah, you're doing yeah. the same things. So uh, the short answer is no. Right. Um, so I think, I mean, I, I currently, uh, I, I mean, left the Sack Rocks and uh, left the project for a bit. But uh, I think uh, my colleague Vishal was actually um, trying to see a way for this to integrate with OPA as well. Um, but yeah, I think that's in the works and currently no. And all the check templates and uh, uh, the default checks are actually implemented on, on, by our own. OK, and uh, second question, mm -hmm. there was one in there that was telling you that certain things in the cluster didn't exist. Is that actively checking the cluster, or is it checking like the li the list of documents you've sent into it to see if like a given service account exists? Like, does this need cluster access, or is this offline? No, so the service account, so I guess the, yeah, I guess you were referring to the non-existent service account, right? So uh -huh. that was because in the YAML file or YAML files that I provided, I didn't mm -hmm. find any of the service account definition. Okay, so, that, so it yeah. is saying like this. It might be in the cluster, but it's not in the list of things you're. Yeah. So it expects yeah. kind of a holistic view every time. That's fine. Yeah, okay. Exactly. That, that answers my question. Because yeah, I was like, yeah. oh, I don't want to give it access to my clusters. I want it to go offline and look right. at the, yeah, Exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. You're right. So it just looks at whatever the the YAML file resources that you provided or some trust you provided and checks within that. So yeah, it doesn't try to actually contact cluster or anything. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. So. Yeah, so I guess, you know, after including the annotation, you can see that no error is found. And, you know, let's say if you wanted to, uh, uh, if you wanted to ignore all checks for some reason for this YAML file, I think there was like a reserved key tag for this as well. Maybe it's like slash all, I remember. Um, you can do that. And that's like an easy way, a quick way for you to exclude all coolant or checks for this particular YAML file. Cool. And that was that. And actually, there's one more thing I wanted to show you guys. Uh, so if I look at all the files, there's like a dot disabled coolinter.yaml. So let me rename that to dot coolinter.yaml. Okay. What happened? OK, never mind. So what I did is that actually coolinter tool by default, tries to find uh, this dot coolinter. This is like a reserved name for the file dot that coolinter dot yaml file uh, as its config file uh, within its current running directory. So if we look at this file, it as this is the configuration file, 
And largely, the configuration file actually is divided into two sections. Uh, the first one is checks. It just tries to define, you know, which checks include or exclude on a global in a global manner uh, for each uh, running instance of Kubernetes. And second part, which I will not be showing today, but there is like a really uh, nice um, documentation to walk through on our documentation page. It's custom checks. Essentially, within the custom checks, you can specify. I think like easy way to do is like maybe like a name and like template and which was it gives it like a template name if you give it like a default template or check template that would break me uh, and like some parameters it will try to run this as your custom check um but yeah today i won't be covering that today uh because there's like a really nice and probably better explained walkthrough on the documentation so i really recommend you guys check it out if you guys are interested but so yeah sorry okay um mm -hmm. So is there such a thing like uh, with git ignore that it can actually have this configuration file in subdirectories and have different um, ah I see type things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so right now I think each running instance of Coventure only accepts one config file okay. um, yeah it doesn't have that flexibility yet but yeah yeah, I, yeah I think I think actually there is a there is an issue about that. Uh, on our roadmap that we plan to tackle. But yeah, that's, as of now, it's a global config. I mean, I said that, you know, Coblinter by default tries to find this .coblinter.yaml file, but you can also specify a, a, like a config, config file using the command line as well. Um, yeah, just I'm just using .coblinter.yaml just for the purpose of this demo. Um, yeah, for sure. Okay. So um, yeah, so this is a global, a global matter. This is basically for you to specify checks in a global manner. And for example, you can specify add all building or do not add, do not add, do not add all buildings. And if both are specified, I don't know why you want to do that. But if both are specified, add all takes the precedence. And this is just specifying all checks on the uh, in a in a really one step way. But also you can specify, you know, which checks to run or not run in an usual manner. So by specifying this include or exclude, um, and I guess this these names again come from the checks list. You can see that there's just like a bunch of checks we have built into the tool. Um, but yeah, if we go back again, and if let's say for whatever reason you accidentally specify two checks, you know the two same checks in the include and exclude, or exclude takes the precedence. Um, let's actually, since, you know, before I, before renaming it, it was like disabled, so the Kubernetes wasn't picking up. So now, since I renamed it to the correct name, let's see if the Kubernetes picks it up. Um, compliant, remember uh, before running this, compliant had no lint errors, right? And now, since uh, I enable the config, I guess there's one thing. So although we baked in a lot of checks to the tool. Not all checks are enabled by default. Like for example, this liveness probe or redness probe thing, we don't enable by default. So that's why once I enable the tool and other one is enabled the config. And actually in the config there's like a add all. Um, so that's why um, now now it starts reporting on these these errors. And this one last thing, let's say um, right now let's say on set memory requirements, this is basically a check for you to. This is basically a check that checks um, if you have correctly set or set uh, if you have set uh, memory limits or, and requests to your let's say containers or not. And right now it is excluded because both are in including this check. And let's say if I, if I actually before, because the checks include excluded, and if I do equivalent or lint non-compliant. Uh, we don't see, I mean, it's the font is a bit too large to actually see everything. But if we just run through the errors, we don't see anything about memory, right? Um, yeah, only CPU, not memory. So if I do, if I delete this from ex exclude, Coventer uh, lint non compliant. Right now, it correctly actually reports on the memory um, issue. The container does not set a container's memory requests and limits. Right. Cool. Um, 
I think that's pretty much all I wanted to show for today. Um, yeah, I think there are some couple of color commands, but yeah, mostly just link and checks are the most important ones. And also templates if you're trying to extend or write your own custom checks as well. Um, templates list. Yeah. So we'll just explain what are the parameters you need to provide and um, what, what is the template name that you need to use to write your own custom check. Cool. I guess that was the demo. Um, is there any question? If not, I'll just go back to the presentation. There's like maybe one or two more slides. And... I had another question, sorry. Sure. Uh, sometimes if you're thinking about a workflow mm -hmm. pipeline, you kind of want to know what has been turned off. Mm -hmm. so, so for instance, the notion of um, you may at a higher level in the organization say, no, I want to know when somebody's turned this off. Mm -hmm. um, and is there a way of kind of in a ver verbosity or you know, verbose way of saying, mm -hmm. get that output so that you kind of see when somebody's trying to not you know, look at stuff. You know? One of the things I see with Linter sometimes is it's like what unit tests. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it fails. Well, the easiest way to do it is just to ignore that, right? Do what right. you need to do yeah. ignore it. So, does that make sense? You have something like that. So, I guess just to confirm, I understand you're saying that is there a really easy way to see which checks are enabled or which checks are not currently? Yeah, kind of enforce. I see. Not really enforce them, but just to know if this, if somebody or uh, then they've been ignored. I see. So. Um, Right now, I don't think there is a way for the tool to report. Uh, but when we initially, like, I mean, this is close to our first version. Or yeah, I think this is our first version. Because when we were writing it, um, I think instead of uh, building the reporting uh, functionality, we actually had this you know, config file right, for you to specify every check, so which checks are included, which checks are not. Um, I guess yeah. Right now, there isn't really an easy way for you to for the tool to report other than you actually go into the config file and see which checks enabled or not. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, cool. I guess I will go back to presentation. So, oh, sorry. Uh, a question. Um, mm -hmm. I see that it's got a JSON output. Is it consumable by? You know, does that match any of the kind of normal standards that? like Jenkins couldn't consume and display in the build reports or anything like that? Uh, what do you mean can consume? I think so. So I guess, yeah, the JSON output format is, so if you look at the, like, for example, a linting like output, right? Right now, it's just print by line. And in the JSON output, I think it just uh, tries to print, you know, what's it, like, this in a like more JSON formatted format, but it doesn't try to like embed any special reserved keyword or anything. I guess what do you mean by can consume by Jenkins? I guess can, can Jenkins, depending on downstream jobs, right? You can consume there, this. There, like, there's some there's some formats that have become kind of I don't know standards that a lot of tools will output, and then uh, you know some of the the. Build build tools can consume that and display the the output of, of those tools as part of the uh, build report. Uh, Are there more than I thought? It was just the like the Java unit test out like XML format yeah. was the only one I'm aware of. Yeah, J, J really unit, J unit, yeah. yeah, J unit is the popular one. There are a few, yeah, I know what you're saying. There are a few tools that do exactly what you're saying and will output in J unit format so that they inter uh, I see. interlock. I see. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's, yeah, that's certainly the most common one. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Okay, I see what you mean. Uh, in that case, yeah, no, this is just a, this just formats this in the JSON format. Yeah. So, like, I guess you know, in, depending on your cases, you know, you can consume the output. But yeah, in your in your case, probably not. No. Sorry, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um. Cool. I guess yeah. Just to going back to presentation. So yeah, I guess. <laughs> I mean, um, I mean, I guess one of the question, one of the previous questions also, you know, pointed out. I think there's just a lot to be worked on for this Kubernetes cool project, right? Um, but yeah, I guess in terms of like our roadmap currently, um, I guess first of all, more checks. Um, right now, it only checks for let's say 
security improvements for the YAML files, but it'll be really nice. It, it would be really nice if you can also do some validation as well. Um, I, I don't think not all validation can be done just from the client side. I mean, there's definitely some like validation that's only been done on the Kubernetes control server side as well. But uh, and we're trying to find a way to, let's say, either utilize an existing library or existing tool or, 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 or something to try to also basically allow Kubernetes to be more powerful in that sense. And uh, yeah, additional resources, I don't think currently it supports network policies or pod security policies, or let's say, let me the third big one, the custom resources, the Kubernetes custom resources is something that we don't yet support. Um, and I guess next item is better customizability. I mean, I, th I think one of one of you pointed out earlier, right? I think the currently the config file is is defined on the global uh, in a in a global manner. And uh, although the Kubernetes can crawl for let's say subdirectories for for more YAML files, there isn't a way for it to specify the config file just for that directory um, yet. Uh, but yeah, I think that's like a really good feature to be worked on. And also there isn't, at least I'm not aware of, there isn't a really a good way for you to exclude a single YAML file under, let's say a particular subdirectory. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's yet to come. And usability improvements. Um, I mean, most of the Indian tools nowadays are like the really good ones, supports automated um, automatic rewriting, um, or even just in reporting on line numbers and, or, or, or you know, and columns. Um, right now, I mean, although it reports, uh, let's say the container name or a service name or some just key names, but it doesn't really report to you within the YAML file where it is or, or even support automatic rewriting. Um, so yeah, that we should really support that. And last but not least is the native integrations. Um, Stackrox, I think hosts a, a Docker image for the, this Kubernetes um, tool. So for you to easily integrate with your existing CIC pipelines. But um, uh, let's say other than that, like for example, Circle CI or GitLab, I think we also have a GitHub action for it, for, 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 for people to use. But other than that, like Circle CI, uh, GitLab or, or Cloud Jenkins, anything of that sort, we don't support anything yet. Um, or even ID integrations, I think it would be really cool if it can be integrated into um, uh like more ids like uh go land um but yeah that's that's more or less a roadmap plus i guess some of the things you guys have earlier pointed out um resources is you know we have a github page and the documentation page and from that github page there's actually a, a qr code for you guys to sign uh, to scan or uh, the or a link to to the slack channel and uh, also on the documentation page, I uh, kind of mentioned this earlier too, there's a like, really nice walkthrough of, of the Kubernetes project or, and also the installation and just to getting started and also just get, getting started. Um, I recommend you guys check it out if you guys are interested. And I think, yeah, with that, um, that's what I have prepared for today. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I'll be happy to take on any questions. Yes, OK, anybody? So do you see uh, with this, is, is this something you see a lot of people put in, like my immediate thought with something like this? And I, I generally like the idea um, mm -hmm. is to put it in, because we do like, CICD and declarative ops, right? So get ops for our, our resources. Mm -hmm. And so I, I very much like the idea of putting this in a pipeline for a PR, right? You're mm -hmm. committing a PR into your repo to deploy a new thing, change a thing, and, and you, you know, you render out the whole thing and um you know, have that be part of the flow. Uh, so is that where you see a lot of this used? Is it used by hand more? Is it are people like really like one off running it? Yeah, so I guess as of now, the more of use, more of the use cases actually come from yeah integrating with CI/CD pipelines. Okay. So um, yeah, that's that's actually probably um, so far like if I see ten tickets, like two or like three or even four are like mostly just about how to how to how to integrate with like specific like pipelines. 
Yep. So that yeah, sense. that's 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 more on of her use cases. Yeah. Okay. Uh, have you thought about pulling it? So I saw um, Helm support in there specifically. Mm -hmm. Is customized also. I'm not a customized fan, but that makes me think that that's something that should be probably pulled in there as well. Um, and I, where I was going with that, sorry, I kind of, I diverged. Um, have you thought, of, is there anything on the board or, or ideas for like direct integrations with things like Argo? Because I know Argo CD, for example, does mm -hmm. so much work already to support like Helm, custom Helm configurations and mm -hmm. Argo and customize and other renderers that essentially at the end of the day, like, it just Argo has this big pile of YAML that is generated for an application. And I think it'd be really cool. And as somebody who's contributed to the Argo upstream, like they're pretty receptive mm -hmm. to these ideas. Like, mm -hmm. you know, have some sort of check process in Argo where it's like, hey, before you deploy any app, run it through this linter first. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Because it's already um, got a pile of YAML to throw at an app, you know? That's a that's a good point. I personally have never thought of that. Um, actually, I should probably uh check with uh my colleague or now ex-colleague they show about that too that's actually a really good point yeah thank no. you i just just kind of a fun integration for the two like might as right. well yeah. together right yeah yeah definitely i mean there are a couple yeah i guess yeah like there are just a couple uh, let's other libraries um we we have looked at for let's say i mean enhancing the validation side of things but yeah in terms of like contributing back to the upstream project no i haven't yeah i guess that's a good point yeah well and, and like i said you could just it'd be neat to be like, oh, in Argo now you set a thing and it will lint mm -hmm. everything before it deploys it for you and save you on deploy. And again, you would all you wouldn't have to change your code almost at all. It's almost almost entirely an Argo mm -hmm. change to have them have some way to, you know, send you the YAML they've generated, maybe an API or something or that is a question then. Can you run the that is more up your alley if you can you run kubelinter in sort of an API mode where it runs gRPC, HTTP API mm -hmm. so that it can be used as a service. <laughs> No, not yet. Yes, okay. that, that also came up. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, had that. yeah, that's come up before, but no, not yet. Yeah, I was going to ask the same thing because I was wondering if it could be integrated into like an admission controller or, or something. Yes, like right. Yeah. Um, you know, actually, a lot of the, yeah, let's say, you know, building. So I think the main reason we haven't really, you know, Make this into a service. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure this is the main reason. Actually, uh, I probably need someone from my company to keep me honest here. But um, is that you know our like main product actually works on you know let's say um, let's say for example intercepting admission control uh, signals or, or commands just to like do security filterings and stuff. So I mean, this tool mainly actually you know we started it as like a like a local, like a thing that you can run on a local desktop or even just like run in, in a CIC pipeline without connecting to anything. But yeah, that's actually a good point. Like maybe, you know, if it became powerful enough one day, we should probably like, like be able to like make it be able to run in API mode or something. Yeah. Yeah, not a bad idea. Yeah, thank you. I'm definitely curious. Uh, so this is going against the actual YAML, right? So like you're not decoding it into anything else. You're parsing no. it as YAML and then yes. doing linting. Yes. Yeah. We uh, used the yeah. Having had that experience and knowing mm -hmm. that you know a lot of stuff you know is presented as YAML and that's a great way to attack it. Uh, would you still take that approach, or would you try to do something that involves more of the protocol buffs, or actually treats uh, it more as the object as it has appeared on a wire, maybe, and and get almost like you know object level uh, mm -hmm. information into it mm -hmm. it's a it's a much different problem to attack but would you yes. still attack it at this layer would you try it the other would you try a combo i see yeah so um the very first lines of code wasn't written by me i think the main uh drive like uh motivation for just using or like using existing kubernetes api to parse it as yaml or parse it, uh, parse the yaml as a kubernetes object is just the simplicity it's really easy to use and it's easy to start a project. Uh, but yeah, as we progress, yeah, I mean, we definitely see limitations, right? Um, like, for example, um, like automatic rewriting is, is hard to support in that mode. Um, and uh, I think that was, that was like a main big issue uh, we, we, we countered down a little. But yeah, I mean, the main reason we started in that way is because simplicity. If you ask me again, uh, I probably, I'll have to probably, you know, work on it a bit more to actually 
let's say, or actually maybe, you know, to start the project in the, the other direction a bit more to actually see which one is better. But uh, as of right now, apart from, let's say, on record writing or just apart from, let's say, directly, you know, modifying the files, I mean, so far it has worked great. So I don't see really a, that, like, strong, strong reason to go away from it. Uh, because also using the Kubernetes API gives you some validations, right? So uh, natively, so yeah. Um, as of now, I don't really see a reason to go strongly against it. Cool. Yeah, it's and and it kind of goes with code, right? Like, yeah, likely have a linter that doesn't go very deep into your code language either. So it, it yeah. makes sense that way. I'm yeah. just curious if you found reasoning yeah. to maybe diverge if you if you had a new opportunity. Right. I think the on record writing was like the main one I thought of, but that's that's really the only one I, I had thought of. So. I guess if that's all. Questions? Oh, yeah. If that's all, I guess thanks for listening today and thanks for inviting me. Well, yes. Thank you so much, Kogi, for coming and Tam also. And uh, we will be putting out this recording in the next couple of days on our YouTube channel. Um, and so if there's any uh, more questions, did, they, did you have some contact or how, how do you want people to contact sure. you? Sure. Uh, project or how do you want to do that? Uh, I mean, you can reach me on the Kubelint or Slack channel. Um, okay. I'm, I'm there. Uh, both my personal account and company account is there, so I'm definitely there. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds great. Well, thank you all for for attending tonight, and uh, continue to be safe. And we'll have some more. We have a our next um, meetup will be a presenter from Cube Edge, uh, which will be very interesting. It's the uh, kind of a uh, a way of doing IoT type Kubernetes things uh, at the edge, so it'll be kind of interesting. And then we have another um, one in June uh, from a former cruise person talking about some of their job um, processes. So, anyway, stay tuned. We'll put it out on our, our meetup area and uh, be safe. And thank you, 